on June 30th, when all of the logos on, on LinkedIn are rainbows on July 1st, they aren't. And I assure you, I'm going to be gay almost every day of the year. I obviously take the high holidays off, but I, you know, why aren't we talking about trans inclusion in November when it's trans awareness month mm -hmm. or, uh, in May or whenever, because it's a performative action. You're listening to episode 35 of the Happy Space Podcast. Today we're exploring the idea that IDEA is a business imperative with thought leader and fellow word nerd, Michael Bach. Welcome to the Happy Space Podcast, where productivity meets inclusivity and everyone gets things done. Hello, I'm Claire Kumar, highly sensitive executive coach, speaker, and your host. Studies show that diversity leads to better business outcomes. So doesn't it make sense to invite everyone's richest contribution? Yet too many people are invited to burn out or opt out, and we are squandering talent. On this show, we'll explore a two-part solution. Part one, cultivating sustainable performance, the individual design of work and life to preserve our energy so we can keep contributing. And two, Designing inclusive performance, the design of spaces, cultures, products, and services which invite the richest participation. I hope you enjoy these conversations and find inspiration and encouragement, for everyone deserves a happy space. Hi, everyone. I've got uh, both Theo and Ellie sitting on my desk ready for this podcast episode. We are all excited for this one. I knew that when I asked to cover the SHRM Society of HR Management Inclusion Conference, that I would hear from leading voices in the world about the latest efforts in the world of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I didn't know that one of them would be fellow Torontonian and longtime advocate, Michael Bach. I was instantly captivated, not only by his presentation style, but his rich content. And I knew I wanted to bring him to you to learn more myself and also help spread his wisdom. Michael founded the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion back in 2014, when there were only two letters to describe the initiative, D and I. Today, he spends most of his time on stage, inspiring audiences of leaders and HR practitioners to move beyond the business case and into action on inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Tune in as Michael shares what all the letters you might be hearing now mean, why he settled on IDEA, I-D-E-A, and how we describe these efforts doesn't really matter. He shares examples of positive actions and recommendations of what's most useful if we want to see continued improvements. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us both on all the socials. You can find Michael at the Michael Bach, and Bach is B-A-C-H, just like the composer, and at Claire Kumar, of course. Please let us know what resonates for you in this episode, and most importantly, what you might do differently. Hello, Michael. I'm so pleased to have you joining me, a voice of experience in the diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility space. Welcome. Thank you so much, Claire, for having me. It's great to chat with you. Yes, I'm so thrilled to have connected with you now for listeners out there. I first came across Michael uh, at the SHRM conference. I was attending virtually, and honestly, I was in another presentation, and I was like, okay, I'm getting something out of this, but I want to go and check out Michael, and immediately I was I was thinking, oh gosh, I should have been here all along. Uh, do you want to maybe start with what were you delivering? What was your message at the SHRM inclusion conference, which happened in Savannah in uh, the fall of 2023? What was your message there? Yeah, so I did two presentations. Mm -hmm. um, one is called The Cost of the Closet, which looks at the cost of exclusion of uh, LGBTQIA plus folks. And the second was on measurement of uh, IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, and how to measure um, successfully so that you understand kind of the return on investment of that work. So both of them... Uh, stay in the world of kind of data-driven um, 
looking at idea through that lens and understanding that there is a cost to inaction. There is a cost to uh, exclusion. And how can you quantify that? So then you can in turn quantify the benefit that comes with inclusion. Oh, I love that. Um, I'm going to just go back to the IDEA and I want to mm -hmm. stay there and I want to come right back to where you just left off, but I want to go to IDEA idea. And I would love if you could share your thoughts because I see DEI, EDI, DEIB, DEIA, DEIJ. I see so many acronyms out there. And I want to know a veteran advocate in this space. I want to know why you've landed on idea because listeners should know I landed on idea as well. I think we're both word nerds and I landed on it and I thought, this is so good. And then I, I learned that you did too. And so I would love you to explain how you got there and why you're, you're, you've landed on that. Yeah. So total word nerd, first of all, I love a word that is also an acronym. That's just fun. Um, so a couple of things, like I've been in this profession for nearly 20 years. When we first started, it was diversity. Then it became diversity and inclusion. Then there was great debate. Should it be inclusion and diversity? Should we drop the diversity? Then the equity E came into the conversation and then it started to be DEI. And there are other words that have brought in over the uh, years where A for accessibility, uh, J for justice, B for belonging, R mm -hmm. for reconciliation. So you'll see various combinations of these letters. Um, I do like an acronym because you can play with that from a marketing perspective and from kind of the, the visibility of the conversation. I don't use some of the other ones. I don't use belonging mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that I heard some feedback from people who are part of indigenous communities and black communities that that term can have uh, some negative implications about ownership. And so it doesn't exactly go over well. Um, oh, I don't use the term. Yeah, yeah, I don't use the term justice because I don't think as a society we're ready to grasp justice. If we're not ready to grasp equity, we are definitely not ready to to grasp justice and reconciliation i think needs its own everything we shouldn't yeah. be lumping reconciliation in i um was really adamant about including the a because as a person who lives with two invisible disabilities i have watched over 20 years where people with disabilities have consistently be, been left out of this conversation and where there's no consideration given to the accessibility of our workplaces, either virtual or in person, mm -hmm. and how a lot of times we kind of get left. So it made sense to me to add in the A, um, but I, I again, I, I like a word so that I can play with it as much. It's a lot easier to say idea than it is D-E-I-A or any of the other ones. I'm so right with you, but you've enlightened me actually as to justice and belonging. I didn't even know reconciliation was being included sometimes here. And I felt too, it's interesting, right? Because um, LGBTQ plus two, like there's a lot of letters. And I think, well, I think one of my questions I have in this space, as I'm fairly new to be vocally um, externally advocating, I've been advocating for different things for 30 plus years, but now making it part of what I do, I'm thinking that there's confusion out there as we have chief diversity officer, chief DEI, like, is, is that hurting us to some degree that there's the common objectives to a large part? Or what, what do you think for the people that are like, what are they talking about now? <laughs> Today's episode of the Happy Space podcast is sponsored by ClaireKumar.com. With sensitivity, curiosity, and courage, I serve three groups asking the tough questions that lead to meaningful answers. Number one, I coach ambitious leaders to design for well being and achieve next level work life integration. Number two, I mic drop thought bombs. That's BALMS as in B-A-L-M-S 
in keynotes and workshops, helping organizations achieve the business imperative that is inclusivity. And three, I collaborate with brands concerned with respect for well being on product design, marketing, and PR. If any of this piqued your interest, come find me at clairekumar.com. I'd love to speak with you. Designing inclusive performance together will lead to the richest results. Yeah, I, I have often compared this debate about which acronym or initialism to use and which word should be first or whatever to yeah. putting lipstick on a pig and expecting it not to smell like crap. Um, <laughs> If our biggest concern is the order of the letters or which letters we are or not using, we are missing the conversation. We have completely mm -hmm. lost the plot. Um, the point is the change. The point is to work toward inclusive, equitable, and accessible spaces so that people who are from different backgrounds can thrive. Mm -hmm. Um I do think when we start to have these debates and it gets into the public sphere and, oh no, you have to include the J or you mm -hmm. have to include the B, um, people, it just looks foolish. It, it, we're venturing into sort of the politically correct social justice kind of world. Mm -hmm. And while I'm a strong social justice advocate, I am not a social justice warrior. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the... Um, end result is far more important than what word we're using as part of our initialism. Initial, that's great. That's a great way to describe it. I've had similar conversations about the term neuro neurodiversity, neurodivergent, as I've been exploring with other people who are leading in the space. They're like, let people use what language they're comfortable with. Absolutely. And forward the conversation. So yeah. um, what I'm hoping it's doing, though, is inviting curiosity. So people are like, oh, there's another letter. What does that mean? What do I need to find out about? What more learning can I undertake? So, yeah, I like that. Uh, I like that thinking. Now, I want to come back to what you were talking about with your SHRM presentation and talking about measurement. And if you can measure the costs of exclusion, you can start to then determine the value of inclusion. Um, please share more about that. Well, it's this is pretty. I worked for accountants for the better part of a decade. So, numbers I view as a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. And um, if for a long time we were not concerned with measuring any of our work, mm -hmm. it just, you know, because it was the right thing to do. But the problem was that when the economy went south, we ended up losing a whole lot of people doing this work, budgets were cut, and clearly it wasn't as big a priority as most employers said it was. So if you can help employers understand that there is a cost to inactivity, there's a cost to exclusion, just as much as there is a benefit to inclusion, mm -hmm. then it starts to become one of these tangible things, one of these business priorities that you can't live without. Mm -hmm. And everything has a cost. Voluntary turnover has a cost. Uh, low employee engagement has a cost. Mm -hmm. Safety and in incidents have a cost. Litigation and complaints have a cost. And I, in the first presentation I gave on on the cost of the closet, and you could use the the formula that I have in that presentation for any equity deserving group. Mm -hmm. But what I what I do is I look at a hypothesis of the cost of, of exclusion, specifically in that case of LGBTQIA plus people. Um, and what I found was that employers in Canada and the United States, if my math holds up, are wasting somewhere around a trillion dollars a year for not creating inclusive spaces for their employees. And that didn't begin to take into consideration the cost of things like voluntary turnover, which uh, reports have shown that it's somewhere between 30% and 400% of a person's salary, or the cost of litigation and complaints, which averages about 75 to 125,000 before any judgment is paid out. Um, there are costs to these things. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then inclusion can help you reduce those costs. Mm -hmm. So it 
inclusion will lower your voluntary turnover rate. And there's lots of research to support that. And therefore, your cost for turnover goes down. It can uh, lower your safety incidents, the cost of which I think the last report I saw was $117,000 on average for a safety incident. There's all sorts of things that will improve as a consequence of inclusion. And if you can look at it in those ways, it just becomes one of those things that like, well, why aren't we doing this? This is going to benefit us. It impacts your top and bottom line potentially if it's done properly. Yeah. It reminds me of ergonomics. And I was lobbying for this back in 1995, going to the CEO of the company when I saw people walking around with carpal tunnel braces on and then saying, but the business case had not yet been made for a proactive prevention in terms of repetitive strain injury. Now there's a business case. People understand the need for keyboards and um, monitors raised and all the all of the things that hopefully everyone has up there. I know they don't. Uh, but the business case is the argument to business decision makers beyond the right thing to do. And so what, what I liked in hearing you is that you're intertwining those messages. I mean, yes, we know what's the right thing to do, but put that aside. That's not strong enough when a business is under pressure. And we it's know, and, and, and also I suppose with the US Supreme Court affirmative action decision in June, we had not an economic downturn potentially for business, but we had an, a threat to the validation of the concept itself. And so there's another reason where the business sense argument needs to be made. Absolutely, and I think affirmative action is a perfect example mm -hmm. of how not to do enforcement of legislation mm -hmm. because what it did was relied on the social justice imperative to say that we need to have this legislation because these yeah. equity deserving groups, in that case specifically, it's mostly around uh, race and ethnicity, that we need to help them. And it got everyone's back up. Mm -hmm. So of course, white people, people felt threatened by it. And it's been going on for decades. Um, whereas if you look at this and say, no, we need to get the most out of our people. We need to have the most engaged, the most productive people, the most creative and innovative so that we can be the most profitable companies. And, mm -hmm. and however you define that, if it's public sector, you can still define it around uh, productivity. Um, if it's private sector, you know, it's all the same money in money out. Mm -hmm. um, if we can look at that and say, no, we need to, you know, make sure that we aren't leaving anybody behind because if we are, we as a we as an organization and we as a society are not succeeding. Yeah. Do you think that the research backing up the value of diversity has helped embolden the arguments here? That there's more and more proof around that the value of having a diverse team actually means better results and in turn a better business? What do you think? Well, <laughs> I'm hesitating. Yeah. I'm hesitating because we've had, we, I could fill my office with research paper reports mm -hmm. that show the positive impact to top and bottom line for organizations that have a focus on inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Mm -hmm. We are not lacking research. We don't need more research. What we need to do is take that research and make it practical. I I'll give you an example. So there was a research paper done by Catalyst in yeah. 2007. Catalyst is an organization that focuses primarily on uh, women in the workplace and on gender equity. Um, and they do some fabulous research. And this was a very sound research report. And what they found was that companies that had three or more women in their executive outperformed the national median average by 46% return on equity. Just a little bit. Just, just, just this, a little bit. This is a, and, and my response to that when it came out in 2007 yeah. was if I was a CEO or a board chair, mm -hmm. I would be immediately looking for ways to get more women into my executive and on my board mm -hmm. because it would have the intended impact. Mm -hmm. Nothing changed. Mm -hmm. The percentage of women on boards did not blip at all. So we had the research, but what we didn't have was the practicality of it all. Mm -hmm. So we didn't take the research and say, okay, company X, 
what this translates to is this, and here's how you do that. Mm. Here's how you create inclusive spaces in the boardroom. Here's how you yeah. um, work on advancement of women into your leadership pipeline. Yeah. There wasn't any practicality about it. So the research was put out there and it was sort of like, okay, go, you know, here, we figured it out for you now go fix it. But the expectation was that people were waiting for the research to actually fix it. And mm. that's where we missed the mark. Research is the self-awareness piece or the awareness tool. And then you need the how-to. You couldn't put into YouTube how to do this and get, right. get results back right. then, right? No. Research is your proof point. You yeah. need that research to understand what's potentially going to happen. Yeah. And I say potentially because there's lots of variables involved. Um, if you don't have the research, you don't necessarily have the business case, but you have to do something with it. Yeah. Like it's not as, it, it's not as simple as running around with that report to every CEO and being like, Hey, here you go. Here's the evidence. Yeah. Uh, because we had to then say, and here's how you're going to do it. And that's what we've been missing. Mm. So who's doing it well, if you were, if you're going to look at examples in the corporate world, <laughs> I hope you've got maybe an answer or an idea or two, at least in some small way, is, is there, is there an organization that gets at least part of it, I'm going to say for a specific group of people, because I know that from my own perspective, we've seen, yes, we've seen movement in um, after Black Lives Matter and the tragedy of George, George Floyd after Me Too, we saw definite swelling of the people involved in a diversity, inclusion, um, accessibility, equity issues. Uh, and, and our Canadian banks just recently here, two large banks said, we're going to do a racial equity audit of uh, the way we're providing service. And so I'm seeing some action in some areas. What do you notice that you could celebrate to say, yeah, somebody's been listening and they figured out some how to. So um, I would say that there are examples of positive activity, mm -hmm. but there isn't a single employer that I can point to and say, they've got it right. Mm -hmm. um, so Accenture, global consulting firm, has posted publicly their representation numbers. So what does their leadership look like? And it's country specific, which is relevant mm -hmm. because of course, if you're Accenture in South Africa, you'd expect a higher percentage of people who are black than white because of the population of that country. And in Canada, it would look a little different. I think that is a good example of transparency because they are publicly holding themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. They're saying, this is what our representation looks like today. This is our plan to improve things. Yeah. Here's what our goals, like they're actually being quite transparent about it. Yeah. I think uh, some of the bigger accounting firms are doing good work, um, particularly around the retention of women and people of color and promotion into the partnership, mm -hmm. which is long overdue. I think the banks, um, the banks on both sides of the border have um, uh, had a lot of external pressures going on mm. and that the racial inequity audit that uh, I think it was BMO and CIBC announced BMO and RBC, one of them. RBC, some, RBC some and BMO. Letters. Yes, yes. Some letters. <laughs> two of them, for listeners out there, not in Canada, we have five major banks and that's two of the five major banks in our country. Right. Um, and that didn't happen because there was internal pressure. It came from the external, it came from the board. It came from investors. So yeah. they're getting a lot of external pressure to do something mm -hmm. um, from these, what they call activist investors, which I think is a terrible way to describe them. They're just investors with a conscience. Um, yeah. And I I think that can be helpful. Um, I, I kind of come from the school of thought of, I don't care how I get the horse to the water. I'm going to make the damn thing drink. And what I mean by that is, how we get there is irrelevant, that we get there is important. Mm. So that these these so-called activist investors are are forcing these banks to do it is great. But keep in mind, it's 2023. And those two banks have been subject to the Employment Equity Act here in Canada since 1985. Um, this should have happened decades ago. Yeah. Um, the and it's just an audit. It's 
It's just, this is just the audit. It's just, just an audit. This isn't action. This is just a, you need to become aware of what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Which frankly, I could probably tell them what they're doing in about 10 minutes. Um, yeah. So, you, so yeah, if we, if we've got an, if we've got an inflection point potentially in the horizon, because we haven't hit one really yet, how, how close do you think we are to actually moving from sharehold and investor driven uh, action to leadership, intrinsic leadership saying, whoa, actually we're taking this on. It's not going to be coercion, pressure, advocacy. It's we get it. I, I think we're getting there in some instances. I always think about the the story of Salesforce from a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, head of HR for Salesforce, big global um, SaaS uh, companies as software as a solution company. Yeah. Um, they, uh, the head of HR pushed the CEO to do a pay equity audit. They weren't required legally, but this, this woman, I forget her name. Um, she wanted to do a pay equity audit. He was like, you know, we pay everyone the same. I'm sure of it, but sure. Let's uh -huh. do it. And of course they found massive discrepancies mm -hmm. and they corrected all of them. Wow. And a year later, she said, okay, we're going to do it again. And he was like, why? We fixed all that. And they did it. And again, massive discrepancies. So in a 12 month period, they crept backwards. The result of that was he, as the CEO of Salesforce, recognized that you needed to have a, a focus on this work, whether it's on pay equity, on racial equity, whatever you want to describe, seven days a week. 365 days a year, and you cannot take your full foot off the pedal, which I like into driving up a hill without brakes. If you drive up the hill and you take your foot off the, and there's no brake, you take your foot off the gas pedal, you go backwards. Yes. That's how this work is. You have to yes. constantly be on top of it. And so yes. I look at, I, I think there are some examples of CEOs like the CEO of Salesforce who are doing some good work. I think there's a whole lot of CEOs who have their head in the sand, mm. um, who think this is about social mm. justice. They think it's about, you know, righting wrongs that they don't feel responsible for. Um, and then there's a whole segment of leaders who they get it. They recognize they need to do something. They just don't know what. Mm. And I think that is the most, uh, I think that the most fruitful potential to focus on is people who are like, yeah, I know we need to do something, but what does that look like? And yeah. what's it going to cost? And, and what they need is this information to say, if you spend X, you get Y. Mm -hmm. And then they need help executing on it. Yeah. And it's at every level and pervasively through the organization. It's not a one and done. We did it tick <laughs> clearly, which that that proved. I love that there was the tenacity to go back and say, yeah, no, we're not done. We need to do it again. Like that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's encouraging. It, it, you know, I've been building a program, which is I'm, I'm purely pragmatic. Like that's let's actually affect change. And what you're saying emboldens me a little bit, because this is, this is effectively a how to understand each person, the work style profile and total teamwork, get people actually supporting the leader because they don't know what to do, but everybody thinks they figured it out or have an idea or should figure it out. And, and sort of having everybody see each other as humans trying to do the best they can with a common goal. So what does it look like and how do we, how do we create that safe space? So I'm mm -hmm. hoping that this practicality will connect to people recognizing, yes, they, they need to do something they don't know how to and are ready to invest in that. What's your sense of of how it easy it is it is to connect that now when you've got a solution that is practically going to move things forward? So whether it be specialist Turna and helping you hire more people with autism because you change the hiring process, they're like really practical things. How what's the challenge now for solutions to connect with leadership? Some of with their head in the sand, and some of the people who are maybe an ear to the ground. I think the challenge is showing results quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we live in a world that has the attention span of a goldfish. Um, 
if you think about social media, we've got videos that, you know, you've got to get the message across in 60 seconds mm -hmm. because nobody has any attention span anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hearken back to a client I worked with a few years ago that essentially wanted a solution around um, reconciliation with indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And in my conversations with them, I said, okay, we can lay out a plan. It's going to take about 10 years to bear fruit. What? Oh, no, 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 no. We need something much faster. <laughs> Ain't I'm, nobody going to be here 10 years from now. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. it took yeah. hundreds of years to get to where we are. Yeah. Um, it's going to take us more than a couple months to fix this situation. Yeah. And there are certain things, you know, there's the infamous low hanging fruit and certain things that you can do quickly. But in order to level the playing field, to get everyone to understand their role in creating inclusive, equitable, and accessible workplaces, to develop the talent into uh, the leaders that they need to be, um, it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably our biggest barrier is that a whole lot of people just don't necessarily have the time. And they're like, well you know, it's going to happen naturally, or they're looking for those instant solutions and they don't work. Well, I think about the flexibility that we've enjoyed because of the pandemic induced need to uh, allow people to work from home. If we were hoping that would evolve naturally, we, we'd be still hoping in 2050. <laughs> so, well, and look, well, look what's happening right now with flexibility. Mm -hmm. How many employers are saying you have to be back in the office mm -hmm. one day a week, two days a yeah. week, three days a week, yeah. or saying full time back in the yeah. office, yeah. like Goldman Sachs and whatever Twitter's called now, um, because I'm sure it's changed names since I opened my. Um, <laughs> I think it should be uh, called Why. That's <laughs> girl, you that is truth. Um, you know, we we're we saw that flexibility can work that remote work can work. Mm -hmm. And people have been asking for it for generations. I lost my job because of it. So we're, and we're yeah. we're about to lose it all. Yeah. It we will be back to full time in the workplace I think by 2025 um and we will have a a divide between employers who embrace flexibility in remote working and those that don't. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the ones that don't, I think will suffer as a consequence mm -hmm. uh, because people, there's a whole lot of employees who are saying, nope, I've had a taste of this. I'm not yeah. going back to the workplace. And so the employers that don't embrace it will only get people coming to them who are willing to not uh, have that flexibility in that remote mm -hmm. work. And, and this is how easily we slide back. Well, and how easily the marginalized people who we saw in the disabled community have higher than ever rates of participation in the workforce, all of a sudden now be invited to opt out. So I've been in some of these conversations on LinkedIn and some we've getting we're getting the business case for flexibility loud and clear. And what I'm hoping to do is be part of that how to how do you design work? How do you co-create it together so you're not afraid of it? Um, I think there's a, there's a lot there. I'm optimistic. Certain people, I don't know if you follow Nick Bloom at all, um, Stanford professor, and he's he's adamant that no, it's not going back. And and I don't know if I'm just wanting to hear what I want to hear, but I'm I'm hoping that you know those heads in the sand. That's a tough conversation to have when no one's listening. But the people that have an ear to the ground that are thinking I should do something, I'm hoping they're looking for solutions, and there is you know, a connection to that because this is, this is both productivity and inclusivity together. I, I hope so. I think we're in a very much an evolutionary period with workplaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about, you know, you mentioned George Floyd's death in, in May of 2020 um, with his brutal mur murder, where all we talked about for a couple of years was anti-Black racism and the need mm -hmm. for uh, more inclusive workplaces specifically for black people. And there are some unique circumstances there. Mm -hmm. um, we are not talking about it anymore. And mm -hmm. because we are now three years past and uh, the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter movement has uh, unfortunately fallen out of the public sphere. The media has lost interest 
And mm. so we're sliding backwards. Mm. Um, so again, driving a car up a hill without brakes, put yes. off the pedal and yeah. we're going to, we're going to go backwards. So something strikes me and, you know, you and I are both in Canada and in terms of reconciliation and land acknowledgement and making that, that is something I'm hearing regularly as a practice of, if nothing else, at least remembering and acknowledging the land on which we are now, which should bring back the whole story of, and the reconciliation, reconciliation, reparation that needs to be um, in force. That seems to have taken root. And most, many organizations I'm part of, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing land acknowledgement. And you're, I'm sorry. If you're watching the YouTube with, uh, right now, which I really urge you to do, you've got to see Michael's expressions. I know he's got something to say about this. I'm coming across it at face. least as something, but what do you want to say about that? I think at first it was, but mm. I think it's become performative. Mm. And why I say that is when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released their report Mm -hmm. I don't, seven years ago, I, I, I've i lost track of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were 94 calls to action for business, mm -hmm. 94. One of them was about land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what else has been done of those 93? Mm -hmm. Every meeting you go to, every presentation you sit through, we have a land acknowledgement at the beginning of the session. Mm -hmm. um, but what does it mean? Mm -hmm. It is not, that is not reconciliation. That is, mm -hmm. I, someone described it to me as like, you steal someone's iPhone, you take someone's iPhone, excuse me, and um, you apologize, but don't give it back. Yeah. That's basically the same thing. Uh, and, they, and you keep coming out and saying, I've got your iPhone. I've got right. your iPhone. And I love your iPhone. Thank you so much for it. And I'm so sorry for stealing it from you. Uh, yeah. But it's now my iPhone and yeah. I'm not giving it back and have a great day. Um, that's reconciliation. And that's where we are with reconciliation in North mm -hmm. America. Some organizations are doing some good things. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But that has become a performative sign of inclusion where it's mm -hmm. something you do. It's like pride celebrations. Everybody has a pride celebration, but on July 1st, when all, you know, on June 30th, when all of the logos on, on LinkedIn are rainbows on July 1st, they aren't. And I assure you, I'm going to be gay almost every day of the year. I obviously take the high holidays off, but I, you know, why aren't we talking about trans inclusion in November when it's trans awareness month mm -hmm. or uh, in May or whenever? because it's a performative action. We have to celebrate pride in June. Mm -hmm. So reconciliation it has become a performative action. And if all you're doing is reconciliation, you are, or, or sorry, if all you're doing is land acknowledgement rather, then you are not on a reconciliation journey. And mm -hmm. that's where I challenge employers to say, what else are you doing? What else are you doing? Mm -hmm. What, you know, how are you making it better mm -hmm. for the indigenous people who live on this land because it kind of sucks for them. Yeah. And I, I always talk about uh, Attawapiskat, which is a fly-in nation uh, in Northern Ontario in the province that we live in. Mm -hmm. And they uh, last year or the year before celebrated a 25 year anniversary of being on a boil water advisory. 25 years they've had mm -hmm. to boil their water. Mm -hmm. This is not a good anniversary to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Um. So if we were really focused on reconciliation, Attawapiskat would have drinking water that, that would, that's actually consumable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much opportunity and things we can be doing. And I think it's, so I, I think I want to sort of come to a close thinking about inspiring the listeners out there who are part of this journey in some way, whether they're leading a team or they're an HR practitioner or they're leading you know, social, social justice or um, whatever small way they're, they're having an influence. What would you say to people listening who understand this um, to some degree, how they can be most effective? What do you, what do you, what do you want to leave and inspire them with? Uh, yeah. And I don't mean to come across as a, a you know, negative Nancy. Um, I, I would say to every single person, do something, mm -hmm. do something to make 
your workplace, your community more inclusive. If every single person were to do something mm -hmm. to work towards inclusion, we would have inclusion overnight. Um, so that might be uh, getting involved with an employee resource group or a diversity council in your workplace. It might be reading some articles, books, listening to a podcast mm -hmm. to expand your understanding of different communities and their lived experiences. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a CEO or a senior person in your organization, uh, it's about making sure that your organization has an idea strategy and plan and is working towards those goals. You know, we all have the ability to create exclusionary workplaces. So we all have the ability to create inclusionary ones. And if you just do one little thing, one little change, it has a ripple effect. It's the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. One little change can completely change an organization in not too long a period, but it requires action. And notoriously, the vast majority of the population are fence sitters. They don't see it impacting them so they mm. don't do anything about it. But the reality is, whether you know it or not, it's impacting you. Are you hopeful about the generation coming now into the workforce? What is there? Is there hope there? Or they've been incubated by people of our generation who have had been incubated and they're, you know, we, the brine has not been great. So what's your thought just intergenerationally about shifting views. I know in terms of work that's value aligned, there's definite commitment to that and, and experience is over necessarily income potentially. How are we, how are we in terms of hope with the next generation and what's coming up? I, I would say I have hope, uh, but I would also say that we've been hopeful for every generation to yeah. have change. My generation was supposed to be great change agents and then millennials and now Gen Z and, uh, but the baby boomers were also supposed to be the great changers. Um, I would remind people that bias is a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. And if you've been in a system for say 20 years, you know, if you start work at say 25 and you become a senior leader at 45, you have stewed in, you've learned in an environment that is not necessarily inclusive. And so you s say like, oh, well, this is the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. But the way we've always done it hasn't necessarily been the best way for everybody. So yeah. it, it it takes these moments of societal change. It takes these moments of, of people saying, yeah, no, we're going to, we're going to throw out the mold and we're going to figure out how to do this differently. Yeah. Um, for it really to have an effect. There is always change. It's just incremental. Yes. And yeah. uh, I worry that we have seen massive pendulum swings, um, not in the positive with things like Roe v. Wade being overturned uh, in the United States, affirmative action. Um, mm -hmm. We've got lots of examples of homophobia and transphobia and anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia uh, coming to the surface in our society. And um, it's all learned behavior. So yes, I have hope, but I also don't want to pin all of my hopes on a single generation and expect that they're going to magically fix things. Yeah, they're going to be part of our hopefully collective steps forward <laughs> and rather than backwards in, in dealing with this. Uh, perhaps right. you could now just let listeners know where they can find more out about you and the wonderful work that you do. You can see if you're watching the YouTube, you can see uh, behind Michael, his books, Birds of All Feathers and Alphabet Soup. And I just love those covers. Uh, so please check out Michael's books, but also Michael, where can people find more about you? You can go to my website at michaelbach.com. That's Bach like the composer. And you can also follow me on social media. I am at the Michael Bach on all of the social media platforms that I am on. Well done. Well done. Michael, what a treat to, to spend time with you and to learn from you and to have some provocative thinking. We need more action out there is what I'm taking away from this. We can, Absolutely. we've got the business case. We just now need to get practical and actually make small steps 24, seven, 365. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks. Thank you for having me. 
You can find all of the Happy Space Podcast episodes over at happyspacepod.com. I love learning what resonates with you, so please leave a comment about this episode over social media, or even better, post a review wherever you tune in. And if you have an idea for a topic to explore or an inclusive action to celebrate, I would love to know more about it. It might even appear in an upcoming episode or an issue of the Happy Space Mia's Letter. Please help me spread the word about people doing great things. After all, doesn't everyone deserve a happy space? Thank you.